Good morning, Living Faith Church. Welcome to you in our school holidays worship service. And uh, you can see from the picture that uh, beside me, I invited people to respond last week to uh, the parable of the woman who lost a coin. And uh, so I invited families to put together a picture or a video or something and send it in so we can be uh, enriched. Alexander here, who's uh, six, has uh, sent this in. And I think he tells the story well in those three different scenes. And I love the fact that the, the woman celebrates by putting on lipstick at the end. <laughs> um, also this week, uh, we're, the end is nigh for those who are doing Safe Water September. And uh, you've got to be impressed by the amount that's been raised. Uh, and it just keeps going up all the time. So if you want to encourage people some more, there's still time. Uh, also during this week, we've um, heard that there is a bill before state parliament that's been brought by uh, one of the um, those who hold the balance of power, Fiona Patton, uh, from the Reason Party. And uh, she's attempting to get rid of all re religious practitioners from either providing school chaplains, state school chaplains, um, or from being state school chaplains. So uh, she really makes it plain that she doesn't like anything religious of any way, shape uh, or form. Um, and so she's doing, working on this. You may recall that uh, she worked out a, a deal with Dan Andrews uh, early on. Uh, I hope this is not part of it. So we encourage you to um, ring up your local state MP, uh, look and getting connected and uh, or send an email and um, uh, tell them what you think about the bill. Grassroots support matters. Uh, also today, um, we've got this wonderful um, skit that's been put on by the Clough family and also celebrating the parable of uh, the lost coin, except this time they've lost Aaron. Where could he be? Hey, Ali, do you know where Aaron is? No, why? Well, I can't find him. That's all right. We've got another child. Uh, Miriam, do you know where Aaron is? No. Why? We've got well, a puppy now. What's the point? Well, no, I need to find Aaron. There's a big point. What's the difference? Oh, Alistair, can you please help me find Aaron? Okay. No, no honey, not the, not the puppy. Can you please help me find Aaron? Okay. He's very cute, but I'm not going to be distracted by the puppy. Ali, <laughs> it's hot, but can you please help me find Aaron? Yeah, okay, fine. <gasps> there you are! <laughs> I'm so glad to find you, Aaron. <laughs> I'm glad you find me. We come to God in prayer. This week we explore daily bread in the kingdom of heaven and what that means. Will you join me in prayer? Let us pray. Our God, make us receptive and open. And may we accept your kingdom like children taking bread from the hands of their mother. Let us live in peace with one another. Let us be at peace with you. Let us find our home with you. And Lord, let it be all the days of our lives. Oh Lord, nourish us with what we need. Sometimes we think we know what we need, but it is merely wants. You know what we truly need, for you made us. We thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit dwells within and prompts us in right directions, leads us in the right paths. We thank you, our God, for the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus, which nourish us with food that is good for us, and not the fast food of this world that is good for a moment, but gives us a bellyache in life. O Lord, nourish us once again, with food that we can share. May there be so much within us that it overflows 
that we have much to share with those around us. Lord, as you have been generous to us with your daily bread, help us to be generous to others. And as you are generous to us in forgiveness and the healing that comes from forgiveness, help us to be generous in our forgiveness of others. O oh Lord, in your mercy and your kindness, hear our prayer. In the name of Christ. Amen. Let us sing now, Jesus, only Jesus. wondering what the kingdom of God was like. And so Jesus told a story about a woman who owned a flower farm. The flower farm did very well. And so she was able to live well in a beautiful palace. But when it was time to cut the flowers, she couldn't do it on her own. And so she had to go into town to hire some workers. There, at breakfast time, she met the Brown Brothers. She said to the Brown Brothers, Will you work for a day's wages on my flower farm? They said yes. And so straight away, they went to work on the flower farm. They were picking and picking all through the heat of the day. When it got to about lunchtime, the woman realised that there weren't enough workers to pick all the flowers. 
And so she went back into town, and there she found the Blues Brothers. She asked them, will you work on my farm picking flowers, and I'll pay you whatever I can manage at the end of the day? Yes, they said. And so they went off to the farm straight away and began to pick flowers. Well, the day went on and the, the heat was strong and it looked as though the flowers were not going to be all picked in time. So she raced back into town with just one hour before sunset. And she found the Green Sisters. She said to them, Will you come to work on my farm, even just for this last hour, and I'll pay you whatever I am able? Instantly they agreed. So they too came to work on the flower farm. So they worked until the light began to give out, and they could see no more. So the Brown Brothers, the Blues Brothers and the Green Sisters lined up to receive their pay. And the ones who arrived last were first. And the ones who arrived first were last. She then paid the Green Sisters and she gave them a day's wages, as if they'd worked for a whole day. They were very surprised and very happy because it was enough to buy their daily bread, just what they needed. Then she paid the Blues Brothers, who had only worked for half a day from lunchtime, and they got the same wages, a whole day's worth of wages. But they'd only worked half a day. Boy, were they happy. And then finally, the Brown Brothers were expecting to be paid even more because they'd worked all day. But instead, they got the same pay as everyone else, even though they'd worked all day in the hot sun. They were grumpy. They thought this was not fair, and so they told the farmer exactly what they thought about the wages. So the farmer explained to them. She said, I am paying everyone what I feel like paying. I'm able to pay the last ones the same amount as I paid you. Remember, you agreed to work for a day's wages for a day's work. So you've got exactly what we agreed to. Don't be grumpy if I'm generous to these others as well. So Jesus told this story to remind us that in the kingdom of God, God gives us what we need, not what we deserve. Everyone needed the same thing. The Brown Brothers, the Blues Brothers, the Green Sisters. They all needed their daily bread to eat that night. And so that's what they were given. In the kingdom of God, everyone's given what they need. Eyes, eyes, see, 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 ears, 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 
everyone just a couple of quick community announcements um, for our service first of all as Graham mentioned earlier the um, tally for our team for safe water September is amazing so just wanted to quickly say to the people taking the challenge you're so close keep going you're doing a great job and to everyone who's given to our team to support the challenge thank you so much um, for showing your support and for giving so generously um, there's still time to encourage our team. If you haven't already, you can head to safewatersepember.org.au um, and search for our team um, or feel free to send a message of encouragement to some of the people taking the challenge because we're so close. We're all hanging out for that first coffee or hot chocolate back. So yeah, please get around those people and thank you so much for your support of our team and the people taking the challenge. Uh, secondly, you may have noticed that in these online services, the live chat function that we usually use hasn't been available last week and isn't available this week either. Um, that won't be available for the school holiday series as we're making some services that are more directed towards children. Um, it's actually a safety feature of the way YouTube works distributing content, content to children. Um, and so, um, yeah, we just wanted to let you know that that's that's why it's not happening. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities to connect with our community. If you'd like to say hi, like we usually do in the chat, make sure you come to the Zoom morning tea after the service. Um, all the details are in getting connected and it's always a great time to see everyone from the community. Say hello and make sure we're connecting together even though we can't meet in person. Lastly, I'm gonna pass you to Bruce. He has a quick message from the elders for us about elders elections coming up. And then after Bruce, we'll have our reading for the service. Church Council has decided to hold elections for two elders this year. We are currently calling for applications from people who feel a call to leadership at Living Faith Church. Please email admin at livingfaithchurch.org.au for an application kit if you are interested. Your completed application will need to be returned by the 4th of October. The election process will take place during the period of 13th to 20th of November. The election process is under discussion, but will be determined in accordance with health requirements, our agreement process and Uniting Church and Churches of Christ guidelines. Please contact Loris if you have any questions. Today's reading is in Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 16 from the Good News Translation. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. He went out again to the marketplace at nine o'clock and saw some men standing there doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard and I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. Then at 12 o'clock and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. It was nearly five o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing? He asked them. No one hired us, they answered. Well then, you go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. 
The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more, but they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun. Yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the owner answered, one of them. I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who was hired last as much as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I am generous? And Jesus concluded, so those who are last will be first and those who are first will be last. The parable of the equal wages. You know, one of the things we learn early on in life is that life is not fair. There is so much that happens to us and that we hear of happening to other people that is not fair. And our gut response is, that's not fair. Right from early on in, in childhood, we say this, little children um, can say to their parents, that's not fair. When they get to school, they can get into trouble because uh, one of the children who did something wrong actually lied about it and blamed you. And you get into trouble. Well, that's not fair. Kids learn early on that there is many things that happen, many things that people do that are not fair. As we get older, it seems that our experiences uh, gather up more and more of these not fair moments, not fair incidents. And uh, the older people get, the more they can tell you stories. And I'm sure all of you can tell a few stories about that's not fair. I was looking at um, the paper again the other day and it talked of yet another yet another large company making masses of profit uh, indulging in wage theft. And the ones that they steal wages from are not the executives, they're not the senior managers, it's always the lowest paid workers, the most powerless. And that's not fair. I was hearing again about the inequality of wages between men and women when they even went as, as far as uh, senior executives in companies. A woman can look to her colleagues doing the same job and actually be paid up to 10% less. That's not fair, just because of gender, to get it paid less. We find uh, all sorts of stories of um, uh, police doing things that are not fair. The whole Black Lives Matter issue that we hear so much in the news is that police are not treating people equally, but are p treating people of colour much worse. And not only that, but all the, the statistics say that's so in Australia as well. If you're Aboriginal and you're teenage, you are four times more likely to be picked up by the police and arrested as a teenager. Not warned, but arrested. So we find all of these things in life make us say, you know, there's so much in life that's not fair. And Jesus addresses these issues here. You might say, oh, I haven't noticed those issues here. Um, but our parable today comes in the middle of uh, four other stories that are being told all about not fair moments, not fair things in the society in which he lived. And the first of those at the beginning of chapter 19 was that men could uh, get a divorce and dump their wives for almost no reason. But women could not divorce their husbands. And the thing about divorce is that uh, because men held the money, of course, it meant instant poverty for the woman. And Jesus corrected that. But the whole thing was... Gee, you look at that and you think, that's not fair. Next thing he looks at is the disciples won't allow the children to come to Jesus. And that's because they were doing what was normal in their society. You don't have children interfering in the affairs of adults. Children are not important. And so Jesus' response in that is, well, that's not fair. 
Children are valuable and precious too. And then the next story comes along and it's about a rich man who wants to uh, enter the kingdom of God. And uh, Jesus says, we have to, to give you money to the poor and then come follow me. And the I'm not sure which was more difficult, the following of Jesus or the giving the money to the poor. But whichever it was, uh, the disciples are amazed as the guy walks away and Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the disciples' response to that is, well, who then can be saved? And their response is so revealing because it shows what is felt in those times that uh, God has favoured rich people and that's why they're rich. And poorer people... Uh, and those in poverty, well, there must be something wrong with them because that they're not rich. So God has favoured one and not the other. And Jesus' response to that, that's not fair, that, that assumption that people are making that God favours the rich and the rest be blowed. And then after this parable, we have another story in which uh, Jesus uh, is confronted by James and John, two brothers, and um, their mother brings them the, the, this request because she's very ambitious for them. And she wants them to be the left-hand man and the right-hand man of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. In other words, when he's got all the power and authority over the whole planet. So she's a true believer, but she also believes in the advancement of her sons. But what she is asking for is power over other people. She's bought into that whole thing that this world seems to thrive on, which is that you can't go up without putting other people down, that you need to have power over others. And so uh, Jesus says to them, well, that's not fair. So this parable comes into the middle of all of this stuff that's not fair about the way the world operates between men and women and children and adults and uh, people wanting power over others and rich and poor. There's so much that's not fair in life. And Jesus puts this parable smack in the middle. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. So what is it like in the kingdom of heaven? If it's not like these other unfair things, what is it like? How does it play out? What's it like on the ground? So he tells a story of a parable. And in this parable, we have a vineyard owner who goes out and hires workers at the crack of dawn. And he goes to the marketplace, which is the normal hiring place where you would find people. So people who are labourers uh, and basically a labourer um, works for a day's pay and the day's pay provides their meal for the night. And uh, so it's a day to day existence, uh, very subsistence living. And uh, so the the owner of the vineyard, the landowner, goes there and he sees a number of people standing around and he says, can I hire you to work in my vineyard all day for a denarius? So he specifies the amount and a denarius is enough to buy your meals for the day. It's enough to get you your, get this, daily bread. It's enough to get you your daily bread. So that's what he's offering and they agree. And I think that's fair enough and that's fair. In the kingdom of heaven, that's fair. And so then he goes at nine o'clock in the morning, a few hours later, um, and he needs more workers, so he goes back to the marketplace. And so he hires some more workers. But this time he phrases it this way. Uh, he says, um, go work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. Whatever is right. So he doesn't work out the fractions for them or anything like that. Um, they're just happy to trust that they've got some work and they're going to get some pay. It may not be a whole day's pay, but they're glad to have something. So then he goes out at 12 o'clock and he says, finds people in the marketplace and says the same thing. So the interesting thing about this landowner is that he's doing the hiring himself. He doesn't send out a steward. So that gives you a bit of a key to the story uh, that it's a little bit different um, to the way the world operates. The landowner himself does the work. And so he goes out and he calls, he calls these people to work in his vineyard. And so again, he'll pay them whatever is right. 
and he goes out at three o'clock in the afternoon there's still three hours of work left in the day maybe a bit more uh, and the same thing and finally he's still hiring come about five o'clock and he goes out and he finds um, others standing around now anyone would say where have they been all day he's been going back to the same place and he says to them why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing because no one has hired us they answered and there's your clue that these are the people that nobody wants to hire these are the people if they went out at dawn and the uh, a, a um, farmer came along and said I want to hire some people he would pick the strongest healthiest fittest the ones with a good attitude towards work conscientious and then there would be the others who are not so conscientious uh, troublesome um, you know and so you're getting a clue to who these people are who he's hiring at five o'clock so and why they're still there at five o'clock so then it comes the end of the day and he starts paying people and so the the people he hired at five o'clock the last well they're first uh, a, a phrase that he's taken up uh, from before when you're talking about the rich and the poor in the kingdom of God the first shall be last the rich shall be last and the poor shall be first um, but he's bringing it out again here and so uh, he pays them a denarius so uh, he never said what he was going to pay each of these people at 9 o'clock 12 o'clock 3 o'clock and 5 p.m. Uh, but it turns out he's paying them a whole day's pay and so they're pretty overjoyed pretty happy and why are they happy because if they need to eat they have to have a denarius they have to have that amount of money um, so they're rejoicing because all of these people are going to be able to eat properly tonight now the people who he hired first uh, they're pretty cheesed off about this because they want to operate the way the world operates uh, which is all about you get what you deserve not what you need so they're a bit uh, cheesed off that they got exactly what they agreed to they were hoping to get a bonus um, perhaps like our big executives in mining companies hope to get lovely bonuses but they did not get a bonus so it exercises your brain Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this so what's he trying to say What's he getting at? So what is, in the whole context of all these stories, it's talking about what is fair and what is not fair. So uh, immediately the idea of fairness is coming to this story because the ones who are hired first say, mm, that's not fair. But the owner says that is fair. And then he emphasizes to them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And of course the parallel is about God, so it's not about money. It is about something else though. What is the reward that workers get in the kingdom of God? So let's unpack this a little because we've got to say, um, parable is meant to be a parallel to something in real life so what is the parallel that we're talking about who are the hired workers in the story and so the hired workers according to one theory and there's various theories about this um, but one which I found um, you know, particularly helpful was to see this as a, a correction to the disciples from the story before because the disciples when they're talking about how the rich man couldn't get in the kingdom of God and Jesus says um, uh, with a man it's impossible but with God anything is possible for people to be saved because the disciples were thinking no one could be saved or a rich person can't be saved and then Jesus said um, uh, there's great rewards for people who follow and uh, the disciples leapt up and said uh, to Jesus uh, we have left everything to follow you we've left everything to follow you what then will there be for us 
Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, second coming, um, everyone who has left houses, or mothers, or brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or wives, or children, for fields, or for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And so the, the disciples are sort of thinking, well, we're like the first people hired, the twelve. You know, they're the ones who are hired right at the beginning. I wonder what their reward will be, the very first disciples of Jesus. And um, so they're perhaps expecting great things. And this is confirmed by the story that follows when James and John are hoping for greater rewards by being Je Jesus' left-hand and right-hand man. And so the parables, parable speaks into the middle of this and says, in the kingdom of God, when you follow me, don't expect that you will get anything different to any other Christian. Are you an apostle? You will get the same reward as the person who is unknown to everyone, but who places their faith in me. Everyone gets the same reward in the kingdom of God. And so what is the reward we get? What are the wages, if you like? In this particular story, the wages is their daily bread. They get what they need in order to live life. They get what they need in order to live life. And that's why the, the, the money is a denarius. So it would have clicked into the minds of the people at that time that the wages they were getting in order to, to, live, uh, to meet their needs to live life is whatever God provides in the daily bread. Now, daily bread here the way I'm using it, can be seen at two levels. One is our spiritual daily bread. What do we need to spiritually live? And it can be seen at the physical level. What do we need to physically live? So let me be clear. I believe the parable is taking this in both ways. Primarily it's taking it the first way, that uh, the reward for following Jesus is we get the presence of God in our life. That is what we need to spiritually live. And it doesn't matter if you're an apostle uh, or if you're a, a Christian who's no one's ever heard of. It doesn't matter. You get the same thing that you need because God gives us what we need, not what we deserve. That's how the kingdom of heaven operates. And that's what this parable is saying. In the kingdom of heaven, you get what you need, not what you deserve. So uh, this unpacks the story a bit more as we understand that the, the owner of the vineyard, the landowner, is the one who went out and hired people. In other words, he called them to follow him into the vineyard. And that makes us even more certain that what we're talking about is, is Christians here, followers of Jesus, and that the work that they're being given is the work of the kingdom of God, to spread the good news of God, to be able to love one another, to serve other people, to take care of the orphan and the widow, and to bring justice into this world. All of these things, these are what the workers are doing. And the thing is, the people who are called last at five o'clock, the people who no one wants, are they not in the Gospel of Matthew, the sinners and tax collectors who Jesus calls? The people who everyone thinks are good for nothing and will, and will add nothing to the kingdom of God. These people are, are, are not moral, they're not, they don't have a conscience. How, you know, how can they add any benefit to the kingdom of God? So nobody hires them. And in this story, of course, Jesus does. He doesn't look at, at what people are now, but what they can be. And when they receive the, the payment here, the daily spiritual bread, then they can rise to the occasion and also be laborers in the vineyard. And isn't that our problem so often? When we look at people, we think, oh, they, they wouldn't be interested in Christian faith. 
or we think their their behavior or attitudes are so far from the kingdom, you know, that, that they wouldn't be interested in any of that. But Jesus doesn't look at it that way. He constantly goes to the marketplace of this world where people are waiting to hear the good news and he calls them just as he called you and just as he called me. So there's one last thing we need to look at. The daily bread is meant to be shared. It's not meant to be kept to ourselves. We're we have received daily bread and we know what we need in order to survive and uh, survival can be tough in this life. I, I don't know how many people I've heard say, I don't know how I would have got through it without God in my life. That's our daily bread. And it's not just you or I who need that. There's people in this world. There are many people in this world who are doing life tough and need their daily bread too. But who is going to help them find it? You and me. The other aspect is the physical daily bread, because that's the other way this story reads, is that in the kingdom of God, people are given what they need, not what they deserve. I don't know if you know how our unions began in the 19th century. But they began because in the free marketplace, the unregulated free marketplace, uh, companies competed against each other for products and uh, the price of products came down and down and down uh, until wages had to come down and down until wages were beneath the poverty line. In other words, people who were working were becoming malnourished and people appealed and said, what can be done so that people get their daily bread? the subsistence living, what they need in order to survive, because the free marketplace wasn't doing it. And so unions were born and churches actually helped to create many of the first unions. And for that reason, because uh, starvation and malnourishment was everywhere. It was in the surrounding areas of their churches. They were feeding people who were, who were working. So unions were formed and unions together managed to um, uh, create changes in the workplace so that um, the wages could come up to levels in which you could live and not be malnourished. So uh, the beginning of unions was a, a rescue story, a salvation story. Uh, I believe many of the same forces are at work in the world today. Uh, and the importance uh, to the free market economy of slave labor or wage theft and that sort of stuff is still prevalent. Many of the reasons for um, businesses outsourcing to unregulated uh, economies in third world countries is so that they don't have to pay the daily bread. In response to this, um, there's been uh, acts of parliament now introduced and, and once again the church has been at the forefront of making sure that slavery is not part of any supply chain, whether it be clothing or cotton or food or chocolate uh, or um, iPhones or anything like that. So uh, it's one of these great moments which I'm proud to be part of the church that we can say we're helping through this act of parliament um, that we've um, uh, helped to develop in Australia, um, but many others have helped to develop overseas to work against slavery in the world marketplace. For the, the need for daily bread, it's not over. And the next issue that is confronting us about daily bread is climate change. Uh, for many of us, we're worried about how that affects bushfires uh, and uh, raising water levels, what that means for us. But for those in poor countries, climate change is actually about food supply. Will there be rain on their crops? Or will it be too dry? Will their crops be flooded? Uh, will the whole environment no longer enable them to farm what they were farming? 
how are these changes going to affect? And again and again, it's been shown that whenever there are changes, it hits the poorest of the poor first. So when we think about climate, climate change, don't think of it as, as an issue for, um, uh, that's politicised, but think of it through the lens of Jesus caring for the poor. How are we going to ensure that the poor are fed as the environment changes? Let us not take our eyes off the kingdom of heaven, because in the kingdom of heaven, people are paid what they need, not what they deserve. I commend you this marvellous parable and I, I pray that you're able to go back to it again and again from Matthew 20 and that it'll stimulate you to work on your own faith journey with God, to receive your daily bread, but also to make sure others get their daily bread. Let us pray. Our God, thank you for showing us a vision of how life can be very different. We all labour under the unfairness of life, and many of us have been hit hard by it. Heavenly Father, be with us in living out the way of the kingdom, not the way of the world. It's hard to be different. May your Holy Spirit Sharpen our focus. Give us courage and the determination to do what is right from the kingdom's point of view. We pray our Lord for this world, for its climate, for the poor. We pray for those who are in slavery, that they may be set free. We pray our God that we may never benefit from others' misery. Oh Lord, may justice reign in this world. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now let us go and enjoy our daily bread in communion. Welcome to the Harrison Backyard. Not that we do this all the time, but this is something special. We've made our own bread and we're cooking it, or a damper, uh, thanks to Kathy. Hopefully you can do this at home with your own recipes that you've got off the internet. We've looked at uh, Jesus saying the importance of daily bread for each person, but he also said that we should not live by bread alone. And what did he mean by that? I think when he was thinking of what our needs are, he was looking at another form of bread, that he himself is the bread of life that feeds us on the inside. So as we cook this, we remember the meal in which Jesus honoured the bread at that meal. It was a Passover meal, already talking about salvation. But he wanted to draw out the meaning of the Passover bread. For he was the new Passover bread. And so we take the bread that we have cooked and we give thanks to God. Well, let's pray. We thank you, our God, for your goodness to us. You have made us, you know how we work, and you know what we need. And you are providing our deep spiritual need with your gift of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Lord, may these symbols of bread and wine remind us of the deep love of Christ for us, shown in his death and resurrection and his presence with us right now. Thank you that this meal is a shared meal and we gather, maybe not in the same house, but we gather around the, the body and blood of Christ. Thank you, our God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So he took this bread and he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And so we break it and we share it around. Let us eat together.
In the same way he took the cup after supper and he said, this is my blood in the new covenant, the new agreement between God and humanity, that all our sins are forgiven through the blood of Christ, that God's love will never leave us in this lot world or the next. The gifts of God for the people of God. Let us join together and drink God's love. <laughs> and after Christ had risen, he sent them the Holy Spirit and on that eventful day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down to them in tongues of fire. And if you have a little fire yourself in the backyard, then may you remember the sign of the Spirit and what that means. Because there's nothing we enjoy more than gathering around a campfire and just looking at those entrancing flames. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen. Thank you.